I'm super thrilled to be here all the way from Bermuda. It is not a triangle. <laughs> Just clear that now. I get asked that a lot. And I am so thrilled. This is my second London calling. I was here in 2018, but now I'm here doing something a little different. So I'm going to go through breast cancer in the Caribbean and talk about that and then go into what we did before our study. So in 2022, this is from the World Health Organization, there were 2.3 million women diagnosed with breast cancer and 670,000 deaths globally. Breast cancer occurs in every country of the world in women at any age after puberty, but with increasing rates in later life. But did you know that black women are more likely to die from breast cancer at any age in comparison to white women? So the burden of disease is not equal. This is stats from the World Cancer Research Foundation. Uh, the last year they had data was 2020. And you can see here on the left that you have the top 10 countries getting breast cancer. And I've split it between European and non-European because most of the genomic data that we have for research is European. And you can see most of them in the, in the right, sorry, on the left are of the European ancestry. When we look at those dying from breast cancer, all of them are non-European. And what's more striking is that four of the top 10 countries are Caribbean, with the top spot being Barbados. Now, you might say, well, maybe you know, it's access to care. Barbados is a high-income country with universal health care coverage, just like the UK, the NHS, and everyone who lives in the country gets free health care. So there might be something else going on. So the Caribbean is 26 islands, but it is in together 44 million people. It's predominantly of African descent with genetic admixtures of pretty much everything. So we've got European, indigenous, Indian, Asian, Middle Eastern immigrants that all came, and we are pretty much the genetic mounting pot of the world. It is the second largest and most concentrated African diaspora in the world, and breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the Caribbean in women, and in some countries, it's happening more in younger women. So this is of concern. Uh, if you are in the field, you would know that most times when we quote inherited breast cancer rates, it's between 5 and 10%. In Africa population, it was shown to be 14%. The top Caribbean country had 30%. So you can see there's something already going on there. So this is actually a study that came out in 2021 by a group that did panel testing over seven Caribbean islands, and they looked at 30 different types of genes. And so you can see that actually, out of the top, you have Bahamas at 28%, and you can see at the bottom that actually 87% of the pathogenic variants were found in BRCA1 and BRCA2, but that means 13% were not. And the takeaway from the authors was that targeted genetic testing of just BRCA1 and BRCA2 is insufficient when we're looking at Caribbean women, and we should be doing a panel test. Now, just for some context, most times when genetic testing is done in the Caribbean, it is sent away to the States from the Caribbean, and they're mainly doing BRCA1 and BRCA2. So this is why this paper came to these conclusions, so that we can actually see more of what's going on. There has been no study to date of unique genetic markers of Caribbean women until now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so at Care Genetics, we ventured to do the Caribbean breast cancer whole genome pilot study. And this is the first time anyone in the region has done whole genome sequencing on breast cancer patients. And our goal was to try to see if we can find unique differences in women to be able to use that for more predictive screening and early intervention so we can have early diagnosis. And I'm really proud to say that we did not have to send a single sample to the States. Right. <laughs> One of the things that we're super proud of is that, you know, with the nanopore technology, it is mobile, and we can bring it all the way to the little dot in the Atlantic in Bermuda, and we set up, and we now have the only certified nanopore sequencing service in the entire LATAM and Caribbean region in Bermuda. Okay, so about the study we did, we had two different groups, the patient group who had breast cancer at one point in their life, we're looking for about 50 women, and they had to have four Caribbean grandparents and be over the age of 18, and then the control group that 
also had to be over 18, full Caribbean grandparents, but could not have cancer themselves or a first degree relative with cancer. And actually that proved quite difficult because cancer is very prevalent in Bermuda. And the aims of our study were twofold. The first one was, can we conduct the panel test locally? Uh, because there has been 17 years of genetic testing, again, all been sent to the States. Um, it takes about six to 14 weeks to get results back, which, you know, obviously every day counts when it comes to cancer diagnosis. And it's actually quite expensive. It's being covered by insurance. But the question was, can we do it locally faster and cheaper? The second aim was, can we look for novel variants that we have not previously linked to breast cancer? Um, the clinician that we worked with, he had been keeping a pedigree of inheritance and saw that there was a lot of you know, people in the same family, like the women getting breast cancer, but all the tests were kind of coming back negative. So we thought, maybe it's because we're not looking at everything. Let's look at everything. And so, Obviously, as you know, nanopore is the main and only way that we could do both of these things at the same time. Just one run reduces the cost, and we could look at SNPs, but also look at SVs, tandem repeats, and epigenetic markers. Okay, so this is our workflow. We have a P24 in Bermuda. Um, we use the latest flow cells and the latest kits, and we did canonical and modified base calling with minnow. Uh, we didn't have epitome on our machine. That was yeah, a bit difficult. I'm not a bioinformatician, so we didn't have it at the time. So we actually used our wonderful friend, I'm going to point him out, Mitten Jane, who is on the project. So he did all of the analysis for us. And then we used GenX analysis to do the annotation of the, uh, the variants. So the timeline, and I want to stress this, we didn't get ethics for 14 months. <laughs> because this is the first time this has ever been done and there were concerns about, you know, will we know that people have Huntington's disease and then they won't get covered by insurance and then we just blew up the whole healthcare system. So it took us some time to work with the doctors and let them know we can only look at what we get ethics for and we won't be looking at old things, we'll just look at the consented cancer genes that we agree on. So we finally got that, what's today, the 23rd? So a, a year yesterday. <laughs> uh, we then went into recruitment, um, and we made sure that we had four Caribbean grandparents, as I said. So this is now the purest Caribbean genomic study that exists so far. Um, and we were fully recruited by the 7th of March. Uh, but as we were going, we were actually extracting the DNA and sequencing as we got samples in the lab. And so it actually took us a total of two months. We started, we got certified on January 8th this year. <laughs> And we went and started the 102 samples on January 15th. We wasted no time. <laughs> so by mid-March, we were finished on the 19th of March. But I will say that actually the amount of time we were sequencing was five weeks, because we are a little dot in the Atlantic, and when you run out of stuff, it doesn't take 24 hours to get to you. <laughs> it takes two weeks. So we did have some breaks in there, so actually it was a bit shorter than two months. And we were so privileged, we found about Gen X during our, one of our breaks, and we were able to get uh, the analysis done in six weeks, but again, half of that time, we did not have internet <laughs> at the college where we were, and so it was actually three weeks that we did the analysis. So, a few challenges, and I'll be going into a bit more of those during the product uh, demo session later today. Okay, so above the participants in the study, we ended up with 102. 51 in the patient group and 51 in the control group. We engaged the entire community from 19 all the way to 84. And you can see that the mean, mode, median, and range were not too far off. Um, what was really inspiring is that we had women who were survivors, and our oldest participant at 84 had been a survivor for 47 years and wanted to be in the study because she wanted to make a difference. And we even had people who were newly diagnosed they were going through treatment but said, we want to make a difference. We want to understand what's going on with our population. And one of the key concerns was, you know, what about the data? Because, you know, as you probably all know, there was the issue with some hacks going on. Won't name names, but there's been issues. And so like, they didn't want to know that their sample data was in you know, certain jurisdictions. And so we were able to account for that by having full genomic data autonomy as well. So we've got sample autonomy, data autonomy, and it's all being stored in a private cloud in Bermuda. All right, 
than all the science. <laughs> so we were able to see really quickly that we had way more than we expected in terms of inherited breast cancer. So you can see here we have these genes, so BRCA1 and BRCA2 are there, but we also have ones that we didn't expect, um, which were the BRIT1, MSH3, MSH6, and you can see the estimated lane, what we call them, which is based on the paper from 2016 on reported numbers um, before and actually what we observed. And you can see the total amount was just under 20%. So almost double what we were expecting. Now, if I layer that on the table that we had before, you can see that, okay, yes, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are there, but there's a lot on this table that are missing, and actually only a minority, 40% of the mutations were in BRCA1 and BRCA2, and majority were not. So when we looked a bit deeper, we saw that the DNA mismatch repair genes kept coming up, not just as pathogenic variants, but also as VUSs, and not just as SNPs, but also in structural variants. And so we were able to look into this a little bit further, and what's interesting is that the prior study that looked at that thousand women had no VUS or pathogenic variant in any of these genes. So we have seen for the first time in a minority population that these DNA mismatch repair genes are playing a role. And instantly what that means is that there are more therapeutic options. I actually met with one of the therapeutic companies that was at, in Bermuda last week and let them know, and they're like, oh, we have these other drugs that you can now you know, explore because of these exact results. And everyone was really focused on BRCA1 and BRCA2. This is our report card that we give ourselves. So each of these different lanes were done by Bermudians in Bermuda, which is very exciting, again, for the first time. And you can see that we've been able to, because of the way that we can have the end-to-end -end solution, we've been able to give results back to 92 out of the 102 already. The last 10 are still being determined, and this is primarily because our clinical lab that we use for confirmation uses short read sequencing and is not seeing some of the longer structure variants that we are. So we've been having to go into the data, into to IGV, and we can see it clearly on our data, and they're kind of not seeing it. So again, proving the fact that nanopore reads are actually superior in that way. Okay, so how do we do with our aims so far? We established infrastructure to conduct the cancer panel locally. Tick. We've been able to reduce that down from six to 14 weeks to just two weeks. And believe it or not, the cost of doing whole genome sequencing in Bermuda on a Promethean is cheaper than the panel test that insurance was sending away for this test. So we now are exploring to do that in a more official way. For AIM2, we've established the infrastructure to be able to look for structural variants and epigenetic data, and we're the first Caribbean study to do so. And the ability to check for novel variants is in progress, and we are excited to potentially be working with GenX on their discovery platform for that. And we do, excitingly, have interest from pharma, because the Caribbean has been untapped, it's uncharted genetic territory, to be able to take this further and try to understand more about admixed populations. There was a structural variant as well that we found in CDH1 that had we not done long read sequencing would have missed, and they would have gotten a negative result and not understood why they had breast cancer. So again, this is the power of nanopore sequencing. And we are, uh, from the literature, because we've, we've seen very interesting patterns in the structural variants. Um, there are some structural variants that majority of the cohort have and majority are homozygous for. You could see it in the, in the IGV data. And we've now realized we're the first small island nation. And I don't know if you've ever been to a small island, but uh, we tend to date our cousins. So genetically, that does a few things. <laughs> so, so we are the first island nation to conduct long resequencing um, and view structural variants and methylation for the first time. So we're, we're also charting into unknown territory for that with nanopore sequencing. So our future analysis that is planned is we want to look more into the, the structural variants, and we're having that ongoing analysis of GenX. We're doing the epigenetics. Uh, we are rebase calling everything with the latest version of Dorado and then be able to analyze. And then we're going to be, as I mentioned, searching for novel variants within the data set using GenX discovery. And I want to acknowledge the team, our micro research lead, Dr. Kevin Hughes, who has been doing the breast cancer testing in Bermuda for 17 years and was the brainchild of this project. And a familiar face you can see at the very end is Professor Mitten G from Northeastern. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>